Good evening. Buenas noches. Good evening to all of you. Normally, when I do one of these lectures, I used to before the pandemic, I used to go around and shake everybody's hand. How are you? But now, you know, some people somewhat reserved about it, so my apologies for that. What an honor, what a joy to be here with the Rhodes Scholar. Uh, when, I, when I was received a phone call, actually it was an email, with the invitation, it was like, wow, a journey down memory lane. Coming back where everything started, right here in Alpine, for me, right here. South Ross State University. What an excitement. So I said, yes, I come from Del Rio. Along the way, that was asked about the question, the title, the subject. The recommendation was border issues. And then I said, how about globally immigration? But then as I thought about it was about human mobility, transformation, social justice, and the dream of dignity. As I inquire a little bit about the road scholar. I prepare a formal lecture but on my way over here, I was thinking, border issues, so much. We can write books on it, on border issues. On immigration, we can write also books on the topic. So on my way over here, I was asking, and what am I gonna say? And my daughter, Valentina, who just left the room, she said, how about human mobility? Yes, it's still too global. How about something more spicy? <laughs> something adventurous <laughs> for the road scholar <laughs> in search of the truth, a different reality yes. of a challenge, discovery, knowledge. But still, what am I going to say? She goes, how about your story, your narrative, in the context of human mobility? The stranger, tell him about you, the stranger. Tell him about you, the outsider, the immigrant. <coughs> Quite easy. I'm making it really easy on you. <laughs> And in that context, I decided to change the whole agenda. So it's a new agenda. And as I began to reflect on that in my way over here, I was thinking about it. Human mobility in the context of humans, as we know it. As people have traveled from one country to another, one continent to another, within the United States, from one state to the other from one city to the other, within a city, from one neighborhood, neighborhood to another. So I decided to share a little bit about myself in the context of what we called human mobility, underneath it, under, under the umbrella, immigration, transformation. As continents, as countries, as states, Communities, society gets transformed as we move along. Life in motion. Along the way, justice. Along the way, respect. Along the way, what? The American dream. And at the end of the day, the dream of dignity. I migrated to this country. I'm from San Miguel de Allende. One of what? Central Mexico. That I encourage you to attend, to go and visit. It's magical. In my case, I had to leave. Sa savage poverty. I tell the story with those people who are very close to me, who actually believe it, <laughs> that for many years, I never, la I never slept above the ground because it was the ground. 
for years. I used to go around and grab, you know, in bottles. People drink a soda, a Coke. They leave about this much. So I used to go around, collect them, and put them in a single bottle so that I can take a drink. Eventually, I was brought to the United States, to the state of Texas. When my brothers and I, we work in different ranches. And I had the great joy and the great honor to be sent to school. I graduated from high school in Osona, Texas. But before I graduated, by the way, I did multiple jobs. My first job in the United States was sweeping with an actual broom with, for a construction company. After that, I did multiple jobs, lawns. I worked at a service station back in the day when we used to actually, somebody pulled up, filled up the guard. How, how much? You know, $10, $5, fill it up, check the oil, transmission. Along the way, by the way, I began to notice some things. But because of my age, education, I was not able to conceptualize. For example, they told me in the educational system, forget your language. So there I was without a language. First of all, I could hardly speak English or Spanish. So for the first time, I began to learn the significance of language. I had the joy and the honor that I was encouraged to go on beyond high school. But at the same time, my counselor told me the best thing that could happen to you, one of two things, join the military, which is very honorable, or go do Mexican work. And they stand with me, the meaning of this very powerful statement because that has implications, not only for me, entire communities and society at large. Stay with me, more about that. So I had the great joy and encouraged to attend college. So I went to Western Texas College in Snyder, Texas. And there I met this outstanding professor Ray Robbins, who said, Martinez, he used to call me, you gotta go on. It's education has a beautiful side if we manage to search for it and look for it, and we will find it. Education has a beautiful side, like life. So go on. So I came to Sol Ross State University right here in Alpine, Texas. There, I met a world-renowned scholar who was passing through there at the same time, Dr. Felipe Ortego, who I met. I was about to graduate. I used to follow him around campus like a little puppy. <laughs> and I met him. He used to take my breath away. He passed away a few years ago. He continues to take my breath away when I think of him. I went to Dr. Ortego. And said, Dr. Tengo, they had just offered me a job. A very good job. I'm excited with EPS. But in my mind, I was not quite convinced if I wanted to be a patrol, I mean, a, a state trooper for the state of Texas. Not because of the job, because of me. So I went to Dr. Tengo and said, Dr. Tengo, what do you recommend? Should I go on and join the DPS? Or should I go on and get a master's degree? Dr. Ortego threw a piece of paper. It's kind of like this. He pulled out a pen and drew a line. Kind of like that. And he threw it in front of me. I was, he said, what do you want to be? Fill in the blank. And, what do, and go do it. There was the most powerful thing somebody had said on me. I turned around and wept in silence. 
And not only are you gonna go on and get a master's, but you gotta leave the area. You gotta travel to explore new cultures, new languages, different realities, a different truth, different traditions, different norms, the beauty of a life. As the Rhodes Scholar, explore, adventure. So I did. I went to New Mexico State. But before I went to New Mexico State, something happened. It's about, I was getting ready to leave to New Mexico State to do a master's. I began to read at the recommendation of Dr. Ortego, Rodolfo Acuna, who is considered one of the leading historians in the United States. And I began to read him. And about the time that I felt, huh, I am so great, I have my bachelor's, my life got more complicated. When I realized how little did I know, so much to be learned. But then came a bigger issue, a bigger question. Who are you? And for the first time I asked myself, who am I? Who is Martin Urbina? He was talking about an identity. Who are you? Do you have an identity? An identity. Who are you? As a student, as a scholar, as a profession, as a human being. Who are you? An identity. So my life got more complicated. So now I begin to you know this quest, this journey, and the development, the transformation of myself and how other human beings we are transformed. And the context of what? An identity. Our identity. I went to New Mexico and I met another wonderful professor by the name of Tom Winfrey, Dr. Winfrey. And another who was his colleague, a professor of mine, Larry Mace, Dr. Mace, who, be, who said to me, not only are you finishing up your master's, but you went on to get PhD. And not only are you gonna go get PhD, but you gotta get out of this part of the country, this part of the world, go north, explore again in search, not only about an identity, but the truth. At that time, I began to notice there were so much gaps in research, in publication. So many issues that had not been studied to the fullest. So many issues that have been understudied. Sometimes twisted. Sometimes outright lies. But also this issue of what? Transformation. But also, by the way, I begin to reflect in my own life. My journey as a stranger. My journey as the outsider. My journey as an immigrant who got deported about three or four times. I actually came into the United States through the river three or four times. And I got apprehended and deported. So I begin to reflect on those issues, but also the issues of what? Of human mobility. My life was getting even more complicated because then economics, money, resources, the struggle. And the bigger question, am I gonna make it in the PhD? But nonetheless, I was excited to get the masters. And then I began to read Viktor Frankl in his book, Man Search for Meaning. For he argues, he who has a why to live for can bear with anything and everything. So there I go. 
to Western Michigan University to get PhD. Yay, Michigan! <laughs> Western Michigan University to get PhD. Yes, Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. Yes, Kalamazoo. So there I was. At that time, average to get PhD was about six to seven years. I finished in two and a half years because of my major professor, Dr. Carlson. If he, wouldn't, if he was not for her, perhaps I would not be here today, as well as the other people that I just mentioned. But there, by the way, at about the time that things began to get better, I was about to get PC. Now the bigger journey began. I was about to get, actually, I was about to get an offer, but the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee as a full-time professor, full-time faculty. And the university had two concerns, two questions. So they called my professor, major professor, Dr. Carson. Question number one, does Martine has the emotional and psychological stability to sustain the academic rigors of this university? She said, yes. Now came the bigger question. Does Martine has the intellectual ability to sustain the intellectual academic abilities of this university? After all, we're a published or perished university. And she said, responded, and restated something that she had said in a three page, single space letter or recommendation to the university. Martine is on his way to become one of America's most prolific writers. When I heard that statement three years later, <laughs> once again, I turned around to weep. There was the, the journey. But then came the bigger challenge. Research and publication. looking for the gaps, for the areas. Do we have for different reasons? We have not studied. We have not explored. We have not documented. But along the way though, as we have marched through this, a number of things, along with an identity, an ideology, an ideology, that is slacking with so many people, especially with the younger folks. Not only the, the, the ideology of the stranger, of the outsider, of the immigrant, but entire, entire communities, especially the younger generations. The somewhat, by the way, we begin, as the, part of this transformation, we begin to lack this sense of identity, sense of an ideology, in terms of who are we? Transformation, by the way, carries implications. Along the way, in terms of this transformation and the context of human mobility, I began to look at certain elements that influence us in so many ways. For example, accent. An accent that sometimes, by the way, we don't even think about it, but it's part of what? Of our transformation. Transformation of an individual, transformation of an entire community, transformation of the entire American society. Many years ago along the way, because I've noticed how we as a society react First of all, how we perceive them, that identity, and our reactions to people with an accent. Of course, it varies. You notice, we hear somebody speaking Chinese, and our mentality is one thing. We begin, we begin to hear people speaking in a different language, and our views are not the same. Our emotions are not the same. We hear somebody who's speaking in Spanish, and our, our ideas and emotions are not the same. And guess what? 
opportunities are not the same. Have you noticed that? The opportunities are very different. But those opportunities goes from the individual to the entire communities all the way to the entire American society. Opportunities. So what do I do? I said, okay, if I want to be at the same level, right, and try to compete at the same level as other people, what I have to do? I'm going to do away with my accent. Some of you, for example, have seen Mexican novelas. You've seen these actresses, right? And they have a horrible accent, in my opinion. Or maybe beautiful accent, depends on how we see it. But then they come out and, and, and those novelas, and within a period, two, three months, what do they have? No accent. There's a course we can take. So I took a course to do away with my accent, and I did it. So at that time, I was dating this woman. And one day she said, she said to me in these words, Martin, you're such a dork. Why? <laughs> I, know, I just made a discovery. You can speak with an accent and no accent. Why is that? And I said, hey, look, I'm just trying to level the playing field. She goes, you're a dork. <laughs> what happened to your identity? What happened to your ideology? Now you're becoming a contradiction. And she began to totally transform me back again. Now you need transformation. You're being transformed, but not in so much in a positive direction. So we need to re-transform you. Bring it back. And I said, why? That's who you are as a human being. After all, you don't think with an accent, do you? <laughs> yeah, she hammered me. <laughs> and I said, that is correct. I don't think with an accent. So bring it back. Because that's who you are. You as the individual. The person. The human being. Because if not. Now you're creating an image. The one you're talking about. That is not you. And this will be part of the ideology. You're fighting for. You're trying to reconstruct. So I brought it back. But now, now thinking about that element, that one element of an identity, can you imagine what it means to the hundreds, thousands of people? The implications and the consequences of transformation. Another element along the way that I noticed over the years as part of this human mobility, this transformation, fear, so much fear within the American society. Sometimes we don't see it, but it's there. Fear, so much fear. Fear of the stranger, of the outsider, of the immigrant. As a matter of fact, have you noticed that nowadays, as part of this transformation, sometimes we don't even talk to each other. Sometimes even in our, own, in, in our own neighborhoods. In my neighborhood, for example, people think that I'm crazy. It's actually true. When we, when we moved there, about six years ago, I began to wave at everybody who passes by. Everybody. Both directions. If they pass five minutes later, I wave again. It doesn't matter who it is. Always wave. For the first few weeks, they did not wave back. Every now and then, somebody will wave. But guess what? It took me two years. So everybody can wave. Now, everybody waves. Everybody waves. Everybody waves. <laughs> and guess what? If I'm half facing the other way, they honk. <laughs> they honk. It's hilarious. And sometimes, now they stop. Hey, how are you? Haven't seen you in some time. Transformation. But I wanted to prove a point that we can actually get transformed. Why? Part of this transformation it was what is being human. And now, by the way, sometimes I see them and they actually laugh about it. They talk about it. Sometimes this fear, by the way, is a result of this fear. What happens? Fear creates what? Walls. Neg I'm sorry? Walls. Yes. 
Yes, as a consequence. But the fear, by the way, before the wall comes what? Our emotions. Our emotions get altered. We get angry and upset and sad. And sometimes, guess what? It gets worse. Hate. Anger. Vengeance. Retaliation. And then, as a result, guess what? Of this mobility, for example, it is going on. Some of you probably notice it, see it on the news. We have all this mobility going coming north. But also in the last few weeks, what are we seeing? Human mobility coming south to the border. People from around the country. To express what? Their views, which is good. It's good. That's the beauty about democracy. To be able to express our views, our thoughts, but in a respectful way. Sometimes, by the way, this mobility creates what? Look at this. FBI. Arrest. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 did I miss it? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Man. Yeah. Plan to shoot, kill immigrants. And they go pass. Ah. So along with that comes this hate. Comes this hate. But part of this hate also brings what? Retaliation, vengeance, as in this case. This fear, by the way, also what? Creates instability, uncertainty, an element that we cannot afford to have, especially the United States. It's a country that tends to take the, the, the lead around the United States. Fear, by the way, that also sometimes is, para, is passed on in stealing who? In our children. In our children. The fear that sometimes, guess what? Is somewhat governs our everyday life. Another element in terms of this human mobility, transformation, social justice, and the dream of dignity. It's an element that for me is central to the foundation, not only of everyday life, but the American society and the United States. Respect. Respect. Have y'all noticed, by the way, that over the years, sometimes I meet with people, the older folks, and we get in, we get together and discuss some of these issues over a glass of wine and a cigar. And to say, you know what, Dr. Reno, you know what, Martin, or you know what, Martin, have you noticed the level of respect? What happened to the level of respect for our teachers? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. The level of respect in our school system that goes from the elementary, even K, pre-K, all the way to the university. What happened to the level of respect for the elderly? The level of respect for the elderly. <clears throat> the level of respect for our law enforcement officers, regardless of the level, local, state, or federal. Now, here we have to be cautious. It doesn't mean that whether we agree with them or not. It's a matter of respect. What happened to our respect for the military? Regardless of whether we agree in what we engage in or not, the level of respect for them. The level of respect for those who have helped us, who have supported us, who have sheltered us with so much love and respect over the years. And sometimes the level of respect in ways that sometimes we don't even what? Think about. Think about in our households. Some of you probably remember. I remember when, of course, this is also hindered by technology, where we all used to sit as a family on the same table for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. Now what happens? 
Everybody eating dinner in a separate room. Used to be one television, one computer. Now there's a television in every room, a computer in every room, a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. Respect. Respect that to me is and comes has somewhat been hindered in ways that sometimes we don't even think about. It. Have y'all noticed that sometimes, for example, we get together? I'm a sociologist by training. So sometimes I go to a restaurant and I see couples or families, right? Families. And they're eating dinner and they don't even look at each other. <laughs> and they're like, or sometimes couples, couples, they went on for a romantic dinner and they don't look at each other. They're looking at the phone. No conversation. How sad. How sad. And then reminds me of George Seymour, who makes the argument, how vain is it? How sad that we want people to understand us but we make no effort to understand others. We want people to respect us, but we make very little effort or no effort to respect others. We want people to love us. We make no effort to love other people, to admire other people and their very essence of who they are. Engagement. But engagement has also major consequences. Because sometimes we do not engage. And if we do not engage, what are we doing? We're talking to people from a distance. Remember in the beginning I said I used to go around and shake hands with everybody? And spend time with people. Tell me a little bit about who you are. Where are you from? Tell me a little bit about you. I used to come around and say, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> now, because of this pandemic thing, we have to keep our distance. Because some people might feel uncomfortable. That's why I don't do it anymore. Or I ask, may I approach you? Engagement. But in that lack of engagement, what are we doing? We're talking to people from a distance. There's a divide. There's a wall. There's a wall. And it gets even more consequential. Because based on that, that's how we vote during election. But guess what? That's how we set policy. Story. Some years ago, I was doing a study that required interviewing judges in the entire state. One day I was talking to this one judge who truly intrigued me. There was something about him. So we went, we went out for drinks a number of times. So finally, one day I got him right in a really nice soft day. And I asked him, well, there's something about you, right, that I cannot figure out. Well, let me tell you. He was, I had a very privileged life. I grew up, I was raised, I was born and raised in northern Wisconsin. I went to school in Madison, University of Wisconsin, Madison. And then I got a law degree also there. I said, the only people that, the only people that were not white were of Mexicans, that was working in my dad's property or migrants that came up north to keep, pick up the crops. That was my only exposure. After law school, I became a prosecutor and I was an aggressive prosecutor and I thought that I was doing the right thing. I was aggressive. Processing people left and right. And then he goes, I was still not happy. I felt that I could make a bigger difference. So I went on and became a judge. So he became a judge. He goes, I was just processing people as fast as I could. Every now and then, a second chance. And every now and then, maybe a third. But usually, you goof. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. As the years went by, because I began to notice something. The something did not look right. And I talked to my wife one day. And she said, I've been trying to tell you this for years. Something is not right. You got to do something. Time passed. 
And one day he was, there was. And I had this migrant child in front of me. And I was about to make a decision on his life. And something hit. Something hit. And he hit in the very core of my, of, my, of my very essence. Here I was. I was about to sentence this young child that I did not know nothing about. But the, it was bigger than that. That child began to reflect my children. It could have been my child that I was about to sentence. And he hit me. And I told him, hold it. And I went to my chambers and cried and wept. When I realized that that child was the age of my children. And I was about to make a decision on a child that I knew nothing about other than what was on the, on the pile. At that moment, I said, okay, we need to start investigating. Who are these people? Where did they come from? Their parents. Mm -hmm. Who are these migrants? Human mobility. Who are migrating from Texas, Mexico, north to pick up the crop? Or are they going to school? Or are they work in the fields? Or are they doing book? What are some of the issues? At that moment, I began to change. I went back and talked to my spouse, and she said, you have to change this time. Let's look for alternatives. Yes, there is issues, in individuals, situations. They have to be sentenced. <laughs> Nothing to debate. But the majority of them, there's resolutions, alternatives. And I thought about it. After he shared the story, I thought about it. And I thought about it for a long time. And that story also changed me. One person, because a person that could also change a lot of people. Engagement, engagement. Now, in, for the Rhodes Scholar, run out of time a few things as you continue this journey <clears throat> in search of adventure discovery a different reality the truth some things by the way to share with the others as we go along as we as we march in this there's this one quote one of my favorite quotes and I'll read it by Oscar Wilde a veces podemos pasar los años sin vivir en lo absoluto y de pronto todo se concentra en un solo instante. Oftentimes, we can spend years without living in the absolute and suddenly everything concentrates in a single moment. And today, this is kind of how I feel about it, looking at the audience, people who have traveled, different experiences, different truths, different challenges. Different ideas, different perspectives, different identities, different ideologies. And along the way, too, here's another one by Carlos Castañeda in a separate reality. Feeling important makes one makes one heavy, clumsy, and vain. To me, to be a man of knowledge, we have to be light and fluid. One of my favorites. Feeling important makes us one heavy, clumsy, and vain. To be a man of knowledge, one has to be light and fluid. Sometimes, by the way, as we get older, as we get more educated, more credentials, sometimes we forget this journey. In terms of what are we doing? I often tell young scholars, don't forget, what, why are we here? What do we want? Especially young scholars. And say, the car, okay, the car, but the car will come. And what else? The house, the house will come. And then what? Hopefully, life is much bigger than that, than a car. 
than the house, the bank account, something bigger. For me, what am I in search? A legacy. Let it be known that I have not died. A legacy. And as much as I can, I tried that a lecture that in some way does not change life has no value. <clears throat> At that time, it's time for me to, to go to something else. Which I did at one time. I was in another university. And I felt that I was not making a difference. So I resigned with the power of the piano from the university where I was. I resigned. And I said, I'm going back home to San Miguel now. And actually, I was on my way out. And say, stop, stop. Will you ever deliver another academic lecture? And I said, no, this is it. Will you ever write another academic book? I said, no, this is it. I want to go home, back to San Miguel now, many years later, and I want to devote myself to novel writing. How successful? I don't know. I need to start. And drink wine, smoke cigars. <laughs> that was the plan. And they said, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. You still make a difference. And actually, I was on my way out. It was a story. And they said, hold on. You still make a difference. Just stay. So I stayed. That's the time when I came to Soros. Now I teach for Soros. A lecture, a word, a phrase, a comment, a touch, a hug that in some way does not change life has no value. At the end, respect, human dignity, and the dream of dignity. Unity. Is the most powerful country in the world? Yes. We will be even greater, even more powerful with unity, with respect. If we wish to remain the country of the future. And another one, as we go along the way in our journey, the road scholar, in the search of adventure, reality, for the, for the younger scholars, let the world change you. And you will change the world. How can we change anything if we don't change? And finally, some concluding remarks. Thank you all. I feel privileged. I feel honored. There are lifelines cross. And I truly hope that what I've just said, you can see them as simple words, but I hope you, in some small corner of your heart, you will keep these simple but sincere words that come from my heart and from my soul. Thank you all, and I hope you will continue to enjoy your journey. Thank you, and thank you. Glory of life. Glory of eternity.